Hi everyone, Sean Humphreys here. Welcome to the video presentation, Tax Planning, Making the Right Moves at the Right Times. This presentation was recorded during a noon presentation we hosted for our clients and their guests. During this presentation, we covered a potpourri of various tax planning strategies and opportunities that we thought it would be important for our clients to be aware of. So if you're open to learning some new ideas in this area and improving your tax planning IQ, then I think you'll really enjoy this presentation. Now, in addition to the presentation, the show notes will have a link to the actual slides for the presentation, as well as some other helpful resources. So I'd encourage you to take a look at the show notes to access those materials. As well, if you have any questions that come out of your reading of the materials or viewing the presentation, don't hesitate to contact my office. Content information and other helpful resources can be found on the website www.seanhumphreys.com. I hope you really enjoy the presentation. What I'd like to do is uh, spend one minute in uh, blatant self-promotion. Um, but obviously, uh, when we were putting this presentation together, um, and I'll talk about the slides, not super clear, but uh, we, we really think it's, it's really important to reinforce with clients and even guests that are here today, what, what role does a wealth planning team or advisor play in the lives of clients? And I, I'd hope that this is the kind of outcome that uh, we are driving for our clients. Um, when I scan our clients' situations, we're confident we're doing this. I've got client relationships here, right here today, that have been with me for over 30 years as clients. And uh, Angus Reid did a really interesting study looking at advised and non-advised households. And if you look at the first column, th this is really about confidence. So there's financial outcomes, but there's also the issue of confidence. The first column, Right here, so the red is non-advised households, the blue is advised households. So the first column says they feel pretty confident, about 74% of, of the respondents, that they'll have enough for retirement. And a lot of polls indicate that people aren't confident in that area. The second column, um, most respondents of advised households, about 72%, were satisfied with their household's current financial situation generally. So they had a, a reasonable level of confidence. The third column, is that the individuals were comfortable with the amount of debt that they were carrying at that current time. So they didn't feel they had inappropriate amounts of debt, maybe it was mortgage debt or debt attached to appreciating assets. And the column number four was a year from now, each of the respondents felt that they'd be financially better off than they are today. And um, again, the reason I share that with you is that for many clients when they're working with an advisor, not a week goes by where I get calls from people concerned about very aspects of planning and really what they want is just someone to talk to. Get sober second thought, another perspective on their planning and I think confidence is really important. But more importantly, this chart looks at outcomes financially. So Angus Reid looked at advised households and what they found was after a four to six year relationship advised households had 2.81 times financial assets of non-advised households. For those households who had um, advised relationship over seven to 14 years, that was 7 4.78% a multiplier effect on financial assets. And then those who had a relationship that was 15 years plus, the multiplier was 6.96 times the financial assets of non-advised households. Now we can get into a lot of reasons why that is. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but a lot of it is just effective planning. I used the analogy last luncheon about coaching, and coaching is really about assessing a co a client, an athlete's current situation, uh, developing strategies where there's gaps, helping that athlete act on those strategies, and keeping them accountable. And I think one of the things that uh, financial advisors should do is keeping their clients accountable, just having regular conversations about are you doing the things you need to be doing to achieve your goals long term. Now we're really fortunate today that we have uh, Thomas Holmes joining us and I want to again give this overview more for the benefit of our guests today. Uh, of course at the top of this chart is the client as it should be. We have our own advisory team that's made up of um, uh, five people including myself. But we work regularly with people like Thomas through Asante's Wealth Planning Group. So Thomas eats, sleeps, drinks, breathes, taxes. That's, that's Thomas's life. And, uh, I think, Thomas, you started as a CPA, what, you were 14 when you started uh, as an accountant? And, um, and then, of course, when you develop a wealth plan, it's not just taking advantage of advisory services that we have, but you have your own advisors. And a lot of the times when you work with people, 
It's not to replace the existing advisors, it's to help you make better use of those advisors. My experience has been, even with accountants and lawyers, they can be very transactional. They'll get a specific job done that you want done. But a lot of times it's not that big picture review of an individual situation. So that's a role that we feel we should play. People like uh, Thomas are instrumental in that particular service. So here's our agenda. We are going to talk a little bit about income splitting strategies, tax efficient investing, investment strategies, when to take capital gains or losses, joint registration of property, and a little bit of a discussion on snowbirds. Now each of these discussion points is not exhaust exhaustive. There's lots of other tax planning discussions that we could pick, but we thought these would be relevant for today's discussion. So let me just set the stage for you. First of all, uh, when did the federal income tax first get initiated? Most of you know when income tax federally was first initiated in Canada? Any, any answers? Okay, shut up. So I've been hearing this blending. So I think I heard it maybe. So 1917, it was designed to help defray the cost of the war effort in World War I. And of course, it was supposed to be a temporary measure. Uh, the first tax form was 10 pages in length. And if you look at the number of people that actually paid taxes, it was roughly about, they don't have firm numbers on this, two to eight percent of the overall population at that time. By 1934, 199,000 people uh, paid taxes in Canada, and that was just under two percent of the overall population. So again, it wasn't a huge percentage by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so that temporary measure continued to kind of gaggle along, and in 1948, the Income Tax Act was passed. So a formal act to formally install in perpetuity uh, federal income tax, and of course, the provinces eventually uh, piggybacked on it. Uh, it doubled the number of pages from 10 pages to 20 pages when they introduced that amendment. And by that time, there were 10 different tax brackets, ranging from 15% to 84%, and approximately 17% of Canadians were paying tax at that time. By 1972, the number of tax brackets had peaked to 14, ranging from 4.58% and 61.34%. And we're marching a little more closely that with the most recent amendments to the upper income tax brackets. In the province of Manitoba, if you add both provincial and federal, I think we're peaking at about just over 50% right now. So if you look at that gradual uh, increase, it's been steady, it's been persistent, it's been consistent. Um, if you look at successive Auditor Generals, one of the biggest concerns and complaints about the Income Tax Act and our tax structure, it is absolutely indecipherable. Uh, it's, it's not clear. Uh, most of you have gotten tax assessment notices at one time or another on sometimes very basic issues, and it ends up being a 10, 15 page uh, document that it's almost mm -hmm. impossible to read. So, uh, Auditor Generals continue to try to pressure CRA to try to get clear in their communication. Um, anyone familiar with Tax Freedom Day? Okay, so whether you, whether you think um, the Canadian Tax uh, Payers Federation or uh, various think tanks that look at uh, Tax Freedom Day are, are on the right side of the political spectrum, they actually provide a, a really important service, and that is if we take a look at every form of taxation, so federal, provincial, municipal taxes, excise taxes, custom duties, a whole bunch of taxes that are built in we never see. In the province of Manitoba, now this is last year, June of last year uh, the data was released. When is Tax Freedom Day in Manitoba? Anyone know? June, yeah, June 10th. Uh, I would say June 11th, I'm sorry. The average across Canada is June 10th, and so we're June 11th, and um, of course Albertans are, it may change, but they're still in May, and I think Newfoundland is uh, you know, getting close to the end of June. So it, it's a bit of a range across the country. Um, and you know, that number just keeps going up. And I, I, I talked to my son, I said, you know, Avery, this is what Tax Freedom Day means, and he was mortified. He said, are you, are you serious? I mean, like technically, you know, I'm not actually earning any real income net to me until we're talking June 11th. I said, absolutely. Now, it's, it's average through the year, but that's the totality. He was just completely flabbergasted at that. Um, but obviously, it pays for services and goods and services and different things, and so there's that trade-off. Um, one of the things that uh, the Bank of Montreal did is they looked in 2013, a study on tax planning, and um, what they found uh, consistently is fuzzy thinking on the part of Canadians. 
Uh, one of the topics we'll talk about is investment planning, very unclear on investment planning, still a lack of clarity on tax free savings accounts, how they work, lack of clarity as to when to use RSPs, when not to, given the changes to tax free savings accounts and uh, how that impacts on overall planning. Uh, most people are very last minute in their tax planning. So um, tens of millions of dollars every year is lost because of rushing last minute. And still a lot of people who through software are doing their own tax returns. So a lot of do-it-yourself kind of tax planning. Um, but what happens is, you know, your accountant is doing it all the time. Uh, I really encourage clients, every once in a while at least, have an accountant do your tax return because you might be missing some things. So you shouldn't rely completely on you know, computer-based tax filing you're doing it yourself. Great idea to every once in a while have an accountant do it for you, see what opportunities you might be missing. And according to the Bank of Montreal study, a lot of opportunities are being missed every year by Canadians as they file their taxes. Okay, so let's uh, get into the, some of the specific topics. What we're gonna do is talk a little bit about tax savings versus tax deferral. Um, many of you might know the difference between the two, uh, but let me give you a couple of examples. Um, saving tax permanently, and, and Thomas might expand on this a little bit, but a good example would be tax-free savings accounts. So if you have a tax-free savings account and you have something in that account that earns some interest income, do you pay tax on it? No. So there's, a, there's never any tax paid. You don't pay tax when you pull the money out of the account. The only thing that might change that is maybe a successive government might down the road change that tax rule. Um, if you have a residence, if you sell your residence, is it taxable, the gain on that residence? No, it's completely tax free. Again, that could change down the road, but right now there's no tax on it. And then we have something called tax deferral. What's an example of tax deferral? RSPs, RSPs right? So uh, most accountants will say, I'm sure Thomas will say this, a dollar deferred is a dollar gained. And when an accountant says that, what are, they, what are they getting at? Well, there's something called the time value of money. So if you've got a thousand dollar tax bill today, but you can defer paying that tax into the future, where we have inflation, so a dollar today is not worth the same 10 years down the road because of inflation. So I'll give you an example, that thousand dollar tax bill, if I can defer that for 10 years, let's use a 3% inflation rate, that tax bill in, in, in purchasing power dollars or future dollars is $744. If I can defer that thousand dollar tax bill for 20 years, it's $553. So there is huge value to deferring tax and paying that tax uh, down the road with, uh, with future dollars. So the RSPs are a great example of what we mean by tax deferral. So just by way of review, I won't cover this off too much. This is just a bit of an update. This gives you the maximum limit for RSPs as 24,930 for 2015. Um, and then of course you, um, you know, have the calculation we you take your earned income from the previous year, 2014, multiply it by 18% and that gives you your RSP room. I think most of you kind of know that one, you know, in terms of the calculation. Uh, TFSAs, of course, the limit for this year is $5,500. The lifetime limit, if you've made a contribution, maybe you haven't made all your contributions, your lifetime limit is 46,500. Uh, was 10,000 for last year was the limit, and when the Liberal Party came in, they backed it back to $5,500. And the one last quick point on this is the new RIF payout rules. I think, I, I think our clients certainly are aware of this. So um, the uh, new rules came in where uh, the percentage you had to take out in terms of RIF minimums was reduced, which I think is a really a tax fairness issue. I think it's appropriate that those numbers were reduced. And before the deadline today, you've got the old numbers, the old limits, and if you do it before the end of the RSP filing deadline this year, you can put money back into your RIF so you don't have to take as much taxable income out this year. So I think most people are aware of that, but if you aren't aware of that opportunity to reduce your taxable income from your RIF minimum payments, uh, it's something you want to take advantage of. And if you want to have any questions on that, just, just let us know. And then uh, Thomas is gonna come up right away. Um, just have a couple of slides that I wanna review with you, just again to give you a sense for the tax bite. So this slide has taxable income of $55,000 uh, was the amount. And um, in the province of Manitoba, if you look at the tax bill, it's just under $13,000 on that level of income. So your net income is about $42,000 and $55,000. And that translates to about a 34.75% uh, 
marginal tax rate. So I'll, I'll define marginal tax rate for you in a second, but we'll look at another example. So on that same 55,000, this is where some of the information we're going to unpack today is um, if you look at, I'm going to ignore the first bar, let's go to the second one. So this is on interest and salary income. Uh, the marginal tax rate is 34.75%. If you look at capital gains, what's a capital gain? So again, you buy an asset, asset grows in value, you sell that asset, 50% of that's taxable, the other portion is tax free, and the overall tax rate on that, marginal tax rate is 17.38. And then you look at eligible dividend income is uh, just over 16%. So you can tell when you're when you're looking at various sources of, of income, whether it's passive income from investments or earned income, there's various ranges of taxation. This is an area that a lot of people don't have a lot of clarity on. Uh, they get a little bit messed up sometimes when they're doing the returns. And if you look at average tax rate, take total taxes, you know, as a percentage of your overall income, and that's where we get the 23%. Let me give you a definition for marginal tax rates. So we throw around average tax rates and marginal tax rates. So in Canada, we operate under a marginal tax rate system. So it simply means that the more money you make, the more tax that you're privileged to pay. That's the basic, <laughs> basic system. So marginal tax is simply the amount of tax paid on any additional dollar of income. As income rises, so does the tax rate. So we're in a marginal system. We're not in a flat tax system, obviously. Okay, so that's just a very basic introduction. We talked a little bit about some history. Taxes, most, one of the largest, if not the largest expense you incur every single year. And if there's any little tweaks or strategies we can use to reduce that tax bill, then it's worth the effort. And particularly for portfolios outside of RSPs and TFSAs, with interest rates being so low, it's really critical we focus on tax, try to reduce that tax bite to try to keep a little more money on an after-tax, after-inflation basis. So, Thomas, you want to come up and continue? Okay, thanks, Sean. I was actually 13 when I started, so it's been uh, six years today. I'm just <laughs> um, so Sean mentioned that there's this tax bracket. Everybody's very familiar with that. As you make more money, you pay more tax. So with that being said, it's, it's pretty obvious that there's some advantages to shift income from a high-income individual to a lower-income individual. This is something we refer to as income splitting. If we look at the slide here, um, for illustration purposes, Sean mentioned the top rate is now 50.4%. That's an ugly number, but when you hear it, it used to be 86%. I guess we have room to grow. And then the low bracket is, is, uh, is about half that. So how can we shift income around to save some tax? Um, so s income splitting, as we just mentioned, that's kind of the definition. The second point there is uh, getting at the fact that the CRA doesn't necessarily like it when we play games to shift income around. And so what they've instituted over the years are called attribution rules. This is a broad, these broad rules basically say that I don't care if you're shifting income to your spouse or to your child. Um, if you don't do it correctly, if you don't meet certain uh, requirements, we're going to tax it in your hands anyways. Um, so they've made it harder and harder for us, but there's, there's certainly still opportunities for us to save some tax. Income splitting with a minor child. Um, it used to be that this was a, a common practice. You'd see business owners uh, and they have shareholders that was their six-year-old daughter or 12-year-old daughter or whatever and, and pay them large dividends. And um, the CRA cracked down on that. It's called kitty tax. And so uh, these rules came into play, which basically says that if you try and split income with your minor child, um, it's going to attribute back to you. And when I say attribute back to you, it means that uh, it's going to be taxable in your hands anyways. So, um, whether you're transferring it to a child, that's a minor, an adult, or to your spouse, we have to remember that when you transfer property, assets, um, to a related party, it has to take place at fair market value. So if there's a gain, so let's say you have uh, $100 worth of investments, um, they've grown to 150, you want to transfer that to your child or to your spouse, there's a $50 capital gain in there that has to be paid. Okay, regardless of whether you receive anything for that, it has to take place at fair market value. So there's initial tax right there. Um, as we see up here, um, as I mentioned before, any income earned on that investment going forward once transferred will be taxable in your hands anyways. So there's no gain there. 
the small window of opportunity when using a minor child is that you can transfer it to them. So let's say you transfer this asset for $150, you pay tax right away. Um, any income earned on that investment will be taxable in your hands, but if this investment explodes in value and all of a sudden it's worth $300 five years from now, if they sell it, it's a capital gain to them. So that's the advantage right there. Um, when dealing with minor children, uh, we, we don't do a lot of planning around it just because it's um, often not worth it and it often there's just uh, too many challenges associated with it, but in rare circumstances it might be something to look at. Now where we start to do more planning is with, uh, oops, with adult children. Um, everything's the same with adult children versus minor children except one key point and that key point is that when you transfer an asset to an adult child, any income earned on that investment after it's been transferred to the adult child stays with them. So once that child turns 18, if you were to tra transfer them that $100 investment and that $100 investment earns dividend income or interest income or whatever the case is, that is taxed with the adult child. Um, the same rules apply for business owners in the room that, um, that may have experienced a situation where they brought a child into the business at 18. That is generally the, the point where we consider it because at that point you can pay them dividends, you can pay them all sorts of income and, uh, and it's taxable in their hands rather than your hands. And the, the obvious point is that at age 18, the chances are that child is making a lot less money than the, the high income individual. And so there's a few things to consider. Um, often people will think, well, I, I got to get this income in the hands of somebody else. I got to get it into my kids' hands because I'm going to say all this tax. And while tax is a consideration, a, a big consideration that's often missed is um, when you transfer that money to them, when you transfer those investments to them, it's now theirs. So you have to think that um, if you transfer that $100,000 to your adult child's hands, so to save a few tax dollars, is it worth it that you now don't have that $100,000? So um, I think I'll, I'll repeat this point over and over again, but I, and, and Sean alluded to it, but it just kind of goes to um, how even somewhat simple decisions like this or, or straightforward have to be looked at from all angles. And they really have to take a comprehensive approach to this plan to make sure that uh, we're not just considering the, the specific tax implications, but we're also looking at the, the, the more broad financial planning issues. And a, a, as you see down there, the triggering of capital gains on transfer, that has to be, you know, Sean mentioned that it's in, if we can't save tax, tax guys like to try and defer tax. Uh, when you transfer assets to uh, a child, you're triggering tax, and, uh, and that's generally not, uh, not beneficial. Uh, some more creative people in the room might think to themselves, well, what if we transfer it at less than fair market value? Maybe this investment is worth $100 and I'll sell it to my son for $80, something like that. And uh, the CRA definitely doesn't like that and, they, and they'll basically double tax you in that case. So if you transfer it, you get $80 in return for it. Um, they'll say, forget it. You're still recording a gain based on the $100 value. And not only that, when your child decides to sell that uh, investment down the road, they have a cost base of $80. And so, uh, so they'll double hit you. So they won't really allow any funny business there. So income splitting with your spouse. This is probably the most common, uh, common question we get when it comes to income splitting. The more, you know, one spouse is, is making a large income, the other spouse is uh, potentially at home with the kids or in a, a much lower paying job. So the goal here obviously is um, to hire want any additional investment income. They might already be taxed at 50%, so let's try and get some of that income into the hands of the, of the lower income spouse. So there's, there's a couple of opportunities here. As you see up on the slide, everything attributes back. So right off the bat, if you don't do any planning, you just shift the income to the other spouse, the CRA will hammer you for capital gains and for income. It's no win. So you, if you're gonna try and shift some income, to the lower income spouse, you absolutely have to do planning. And so the planning options are, one of them seems kind of novel, but can make a difference. If the lower income spouse has some income, um, all they should, uh, or, I'm sorry, the higher income spouse should basically pay all of the household expenses. It seems kind of silly, but all that's doing is maximizing the, uh, the cash that the lower income spouse has uh, in order to invest. So if one spouse makes 100,000, the other spouse makes 30,000, the $100,000 spouse should, 
should be making all the expenditures so as much as possible is being invested in the name of the lower income spouse. That's, a, that's kind of the most straightforward one and one that's, I guess, pretty easy to, uh, to implement and defend if the CRA ever came asking. The second is uh, the prescribed rate loan method. This is a method that we, we see relatively common um, in, in narrow circumstances, I'll say, where it's a situation where um, the CRA has what they call a prescribed interest rate. The prescribed interest rate is set at 1% right now. Interest rates are obviously at all-time lows, but they've been there for a while, so this, this rate hasn't moved. It'll fluctuate. As the Bank of Canada raises their rates, the CRA will raise what they call the prescribed rate. What this strategy allows you to do is um, if the one spouse has a million dollars worth of investments in, um, of cash in their name, okay, they can lend that money to the lower income spouse at 1% interest rate. The hope is that that lower income spouse can now invest that money and earn substantially more than, than 1%. So now that spouse has a thousand or has a 1% interest expense they have to pay to the high income spouse, but then they're investing that money and hopefully earning, you know, seven, eight percent or, or, or whatever the case is. Um, the key thing here is that that money actually has to change hands and that money has to be reported as income on the high income uh, tax return. But this is still beneficial because theoretically that the higher income spouse will have a interest income equal to 1% and the lower income spouse will have you know, investment income equal to uh, hopefully, you know, much more than, than 1%. So that's one strategy. Um, and then there, there, there's another strategy which involves actually transferring assets. It, it's a bit more complicated, but it, it's such where if, if for some reason the low income spouse has inherited a cottage, let's say, so they have a, a $500,000 cottage that they in inherited from their parents and it's solely in their name, okay? And the high income spouse then has all of the investments. What they can do is actually have a sale. And so the low income spouse says, okay, I'm gonna sell you this cottage, which doesn't generate income, and you're gonna pay for, pay for it with cash. And so then now the high income spouse, rather than having investments that can, are earning more income, they have a cottage. And the low income spouse now has $500,000 that they can invest and be taxed in the, the low rate. So again, these are just some, just some ideas. There's a, we're just kind of scraping the surface, but hopefully this, uh, this gets it started. As you see, uh, it's kind of a plug for later on, tax deferred, <coughs> tax efficient investing is obviously much more straightforward. So if we just get you in the right sort of uh, portfolios with tax efficient investing, then hopefully you don't have to worry about these complex strategies. Pension splitting, um, again, very high level overview here. Um, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with pension income splitting. If I go to the next slide, you'll see the types of income that are eligible to be split. Um, if you're 65 and older, any sort of pension, whether it's RIFs or pension, regular pensions are, are eligible. Under 65, it's a little bit more restricted, but there's still opportunities there. Um, so uh, obviously that's something to keep in mind. That's very easy to do. There's no planning involved because whoever's preparing your tax return basically has to click a box on the tax return that, and then the, the tax programs nowadays, they make our lives a lot easier where you bas it basically just figures out the number that's split and, uh, and it's one step closer to people like me not having a job, I guess. <laughs> okay, so tax efficient investing. I'm just gonna set it up quickly before, before Sean comes in here. Um, this slide is basically restating a lot of what Sean's graph said, which is um, uh, one thing that people don't think about is that people see high distributions from their investments and think that's great, um, but the important thing is what type of distributions are you receiving here. Um, if you look, uh, if you earn interest income, right off the bat you're losing half the tax at the top rate. Well, if you're, well, if you're receiving eligible dividends, you're, you're in a much better place. Um, so making sure that your portfolios are, are, are kind of uh, pushing out the right types of income will, will really save you a lot of money going forward. Over to you, Sean. Okay, thanks, Thomas. Um, so let's spend a few minutes looking at tax-efficient investing. I'm gonna give you some very, very practical examples uh, around this topic. Now, obviously with your you know, RSP accounts, your tax-free savings accounts, um, tax-effective investing is not a critical issue, right? Because everything grows either tax-deferred or tax-free. When you pull money out of the RSP account or RIF account, it's taxable. 
But if you already maximize, you maximize your TFSAs, you've done your RSPs, but you have capital that you're looking to invest, right? So once you do that, now you're in a situation where you might get a T3 or a T5, and that T3 or T5 is going to have maybe some interest income, dividend income, or realized capital gains income. Now this chart uh, that Thomas put up kind of shows you the difference. And obviously on the, on the first chart, you look at interest income, very, very tax attractive which is not what we want. And I alluded to the fact that we've got very, very low interest rates, obviously. So if you have a low yield, you're already now dealing with a tax bill. And then you also factor in something as um, uh, subtle as inflation, which might erode another 2 2.5% of that return. I mean, you're not keeping anything. In fact, depending on how you're investing, you might even be actually losing money on an after-tax, after-inflation basis. So the example I have for you here is, is kind of draws it out in a little more detail. And so the first chart is we've got a $10,000 initial investment. And uh, we're going to add $1,000 per year. And we're going to see if we can get 5% in that example. And over a 25-year period, that's going to grow to just over $83,000. Great. So we have you know, a reasonably uh, good portfolio growth over that time frame if we get, get 5%. Um, if we factor the uh, inflation rate over that time frame and, um, and then look at the, the loss to taxes and inflation, you can see that over that time frame that $83,000 has been eroded to the tune of 42557 So our real return on that portfolio over that 25-year period was 1.01%. Now the problem with this is that when you get your investment statements, no one's actually calculating for you. We focus on the nominal return. We say, well, here, what did I do as a portfolio return? But no one's giving you a statement that says, okay, now on an after inflation basis and looking at your tax rate, what did you actually earn in that portfolio? It's actually really critical to connect those two. Right? So what we want to do when we look at investing is to connect the dots and go, wow, okay, so I got five, that seemed like a good return but I didn't keep very much at the end of the day. So that's why this is a really critical area. So when we talk about tax efficient investing, this is a, a chart that kind of summarizes or you know, goes over it. But basically the things we want to talk about would be tax preferred. So tax preferred, we already alluded to it. What's tax preferred income as it relates to investing? Capital gains and dividend income would be an example of tax deferred. We've already talked about deferral. So are the ways we can defer income um, so it's not taxed right away. Most importantly is this ability to switch. I'll never forget it. Back in the 90s, uh, we had our offices in the Trizac building. And at that time, uh, Nortel had their regional head office in the Trizac building on 360 Main. And on a regular basis, I'd be riding up and down the elevators with these guys who worked for Nortel. Now, Everyone knows what happened to Nortel in terms of the fall of the share price, but you know what was happening to that share price for a bit of time. What happened to it? It went up exponentially. And these guys were like Cheshire cats. I mean, they had big smiles on their faces, and they were very excited about this run that the stock uh, was going through. And I remember one of my partners at the time said, you know, have you realized any capital gains? Have you consolidated any profits? And their comment was, well, I mean, the stock might lose a little bit of value, but if I sold today, I'd give up you know, a third of that value through taxes. So what do you think they did? They never thought the stock would fall below the rate of tax they would pay if they actually sold the stock. So they held on to it, and the rest is history. There's nothing left, basically, right? So it's really important that we don't let the tax tail wag the investment dog. And you see a lot of people doing that when it comes to investing. Now, wouldn't it be great if we had an investment option that would allow us to rebalance or switch without having to worry about taxes. That would be the ideal. So we talked about interest, dividends, and capital gains. Interest and dividends, or dividends and capital gains are, are tax preference in terms of their treatment. But one of the areas that we often will recommend clients consider is something called a corporate class investment. Now, when you look at corporate class investments, a million dollars over 25 years. Um, but you can see the blue line here grew to about, let me get my laser, 3.9 million. The line below it is a regular investment trust. Now, if you've ever had a mutual fund, 
Uh, one of the concerns that many people have with mutual funds outside of an RSP, outside of a TFSA, is these distributions you get at the end of the year. So anyone got in a T3 distribution on their mutual fund? They get their T3 and there's all these realized capital gains, some interest income, some dividend income. So why does that happen? Anyone know why that happens? So a mutual fund trust is what's called an inter vivos trust. And with an inter vivos trust, they pay out the income to you. And the reason they pay it, if they don't, and the income stays within the trust, is tax at the top tax bracket. So what typically happens is they'll pay out the income that's been earned, you get a T3 or a T5, and then what typically happens with the income? It gets reinvested often. So a lot of people have just a reinvestment of dividends. That's pretty common out there. But the other structure is called a corporate class investment account. And we won't go into a lot of detail today because it actually can be a fairly detailed topic. But the most important thing to, to see here is the top blue line had way more capital. Even if you liquidated everything at the end of 25 years, you still have a lot more capital in a corporate class investment than a regular mutual fund trust. And the reason is a corporate class investment doesn't have to pay out that income every year. They're subject to a different tax structure. And so it's that deferral, right? So if I earn income, if I get growth, wouldn't it be nice if I wouldn't have to pay that distribution every year, be subject to tax, then reinvest? It'd be way better if I could keep all those growth, those gains, that income within the trust or within the corporate class structure and allow the money to compound. It's very powerful. The second thing about this structure is you have the ability to adjust or make changes to your portfolio. So the example would be, I have, um, let's say, an investment in the U.S. market. It does really, really well. I've got some great gains. Remember my discussion about the Nortel stock? Never got sold because there was significant gains in the portfolio. Well, with corporate class structures, you can actually fine tune from one investment area to another area, and it's not deemed to be a disposition for tax purposes. There's no tax that's triggered. So I could actually go from a growth portfolio in the U.S. market to a conservative income portfolio and fine to my portfolio and take profits, there's no tax triggered on that transaction. Very, very powerful. So you can, think that you can go through and rebalance your portfolio as often as you want and no tax is triggered. So now you don't have the tax tail wagging the investment dog. You're making your rebalancing decisions uh, prudently from an investment standpoint. Uh, okay, just a few more uh, quick points on corporate class. So this is more for the um, the second point is more for the business owner, but for those that are interested in uh, philanthropy, for example, the corporate class structure does provide a little bit of benefits. Um, one of the advantages, I guess if you, if you want to say, put it bluntly, corporate class is able to take um, interest income and, and kind of convert it in a way to uh, capital gains by deferring it, right? So at the end of the day, uh, rather than paying out distributions, we're deferring the distributions and you're getting a nice unrealized capital gain. Um, one of the advantages here is when you donate uh, securities, rather than donating cash, um, you get a favorable tax treatment. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but it's something to consider that if, for example, you have a, a holding company that holds uh, investments and there's significant unrealized gains um, on those investments, if you're using corporate class, uh, chances are there would be, and uh, when you donate that to a charity, rather than donating cash, um, you get a nice bump in the, um, from the tax perspective. Again, if somebody has, is curious about this or wants to talk more in detail, we can, uh, please, please feel free to, to stop me on the way out. So funding your TFSA with the RSP. I think RSPs in general, people think that this is something that I'm gonna contribute to and just ignore and forget about until I turn 71. And then at that point, I have to start riffing, and that's when I take out all the income. Um, that's fair, and, and that's true in many circumstances, but I think it, it goes back to the importance of really looking at your situation annually and figuring out what the most tax-effective way of pulling out your income is. Um, in years where potentially your income's lower, or if you suspect that you're, um, you have a, you know, perhaps a, a downturn, you don't receive a bonus like you expect or like you normally do, so you have low income, maybe it makes sense to, uh, to pull out some of your RRSP. Um, another situation would be uh, often, you know, you retire at age 60 um, and you don't start getting CPP for five years if you defer it or OAS and things like that. Often between uh, retirement and 71, um, when you have to start ripping, you have some low income years. 
And uh, at that time, it might make sense to, to pull some money out of your RSP a bit early. Um, again, if you pull money out of your RSP, there's no real better way to put it, uh, to place that money than to TFSA when you, uh, when you don't have to worry about that uh, paying any more tax. You know, when to take your profits. Um, this this uh, kind of a ties in perfectly to uh, the Sean story about Nortel. That was a situation where um, some people chose not to take their profits. Some people wanted to ride it out and ended up paying the price in a big way. Um, so taking your profits, again, I'm probably starting to sound like a broken record where we have to look at it from every angle. Um, but that can't just be strictly an investment decision or a tax decision. It really has to be looked at uh, from every angle to make sure that you're making the best decision. So uh, if you look here, is um, consider whether you have uh, capital losses, consider what your income levels are for the year. Um, and then a big thing is considering what your asset allocation is. Um, if you are a person that's comfortable with a 60% equity, 40% income portfolio, and equities explode, and all of a sudden your portfolio is 80% equity and 20% and fixed income. Um, that might be really nice because you've had great returns, but it might make sense at that point to, to take some into profit and to kind of get yourself uh, back to square one, uh, back to the risk tolerance that you're happy with. And just a quick point about capital losses. Um, capital losses um, can, be offset, can be used to offset capital gains. Um, so in a way, um, that's the silver lining for a capital loss that you can offset future capital gains. Um, if you have a capital loss, it can be carried back three years. So just because you don't have one when you incur that gain, uh, if you have a future capital loss, it can be carried back three years and get some tax back. And when you incur a capital loss, there's no rush to use it because uh, the CRA is giving you the rest of your life to, to find a capital gain to apply it against. Hopefully it doesn't take that long, but uh, um, they're, they're not expiring anytime soon. Superficial losses, this is one thing that when you work with, with Sean or Phil or the team there, you're, you're certainly, they'll be careful about this, but when you want to trigger a capital loss with a stock, you have to be sure that you don't repurchase that stock within 30 days, otherwise that capital loss falls off the table. So there's no real funny business where you, you know, um, sell a stock or sell an investment, trigger a capital loss, and then repurchase it five days later, uh, the CRA is going to well, they may catch you, they may not, I guess, but anyways, uh, um, that's called a superficial loss and is, um, is, is denied. So basically, you can't, can't use that. 30 days is the cutoff. You have to wait, uh, I guess, wait 31 days before you repurchase that stock. This one, for those that were at the, the, um, the branch presentation back uh, at the Kubota Center, they've, they've already had to listen to me drone on about joint registration of assets, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick here. If somebody has a questions afterwards, uh, please feel free. Um, the question, should you consider holding your assets jointly with your child to avoid probate? Probate is something, it's kind of a, a swear word almost for people. They, they hate the idea of having to pay probate one day, and so they'll do whatever it takes to get out of it. That might involve adding their child's name to their bank account or their investment account, or um, the one we see most commonly is, uh, you know, kind of do-it-yourself estate planning, we call it, where you um, change the title on your cottage so that it now reads uh, you know, father, son, or mom and daughter, or whatever the case is. I'm going to go through this example quickly. Um, here are the drawbacks. Again, if you transfer the property, 50% of the property to a, a child, you're going to have immediate tax. Potentially, you could use the principal residence exemption, but maybe that's not available. So immediate tax when you transfer it. Um, as was the case with investments, your child now has equal rights. Um, that might not be a problem, might not be an issue at all, but at the end of the day, if you want to sell your cottage five years later, that child now has a say. They have a 50% say in, in what happens. That complicates things. Um, yes, it does save probate because on death, that cottage will roll directly to your child, but um, you can't change your mind. Sometimes a parent might think, this is a great idea. I'm going to add son or daughter to the deed. And then uh, what happens is that son or daughter marries someone that perhaps a parent isn't a huge fan of. There's no take backs. So that cottage is now 50% owned by that child. And uh, now if that child and the, the spouse that maybe doesn't get along great with the family, if they have problems and they split, that spouse that you can't stand might end up having a claim against that cottage. And so basically you're really complicating things and really bringing a little bit, quite a bit more complexity into the situation. 
And then uh, I think the big thing is that family disagreements, we're trying to keep things as smooth as possible. Although saving that, that probate might be nice, um, it is only $7 on every $1,000. And so it's, although it's worth planning for sometimes, it's maybe not at the expense of family relations. If there's more than one child and favorite son gets his name on the, the title, maybe, uh, maybe the youngest, like me, you know, might be left out in the cold and, uh, and disappointed. Um, and now we're going to, or Sean will touch a, spend a few minutes touching on kind of issues facing the snowbirds and, uh, and spending time in the U.S. So if you're here today, you're not worrying about this issue. <laughs> so, um, so, so I'll, I'll quickly introduce it, but what we'll do is, in the, uh, in the, just for the element of time, we, we said we try to get you out of here at 1, so we're almost at that point. So um, make sure you provide your email. If you're a guest here, if you're a client, you're going to get it automatically. If you're a guest today, make sure that in the feedback form you provide your email address so we can get you a link to the presentation. So we're going to do some uh, video and we'll expand upon this, this subject. So any topics we didn't get to in as much detail as we would have liked, the video will expand on it and we'll have additional resources. Quick example, the TFSA discussion, we have a video resource on my website, www.seanhumphreys.com. You won't forget that, right? seanhumphreys.com. So if you just type in TFSA, it'll come up and you can take a look at that to expand that topic. So this is, this is a number you need to keep uh, in mind. Uh, monitor your time in the U.S. Ensure that you are not present in the U.S. for 183 or more days in any 12-month period. Okay, so that, that sounds pretty straightforward. However, there's something called the substantial residence test. And this is where we can get ourselves tripped up a little bit in terms of the U.S. tax authorities. So that substantial presence test goes as follows. You spend 31 days in more or more in the U.S. in the current year and the total of all the days in the current year plus one-third of the days in the previous year plus one-sixth of the days in the second previous year equals 180 or more. Okay, so how many of you are keeping track of that? And I, I'll tell you that most snowbirds are not all that diligent around keeping track of this. And if you fall outside this basic formula, you basically come under the, the, the long reach of the U.S. tax authorities and you're deemed to have to pay tax on your, on your worldwide income in the U.S. So I'll give you a, a good, just quick example. So in this example, we stayed 31 days. So in 2014, it was 120 days. In 2013, it was what, 40 days, 2012. 40 days, we do the one-third multiplier, the one-sixth multiplier, and we had, what, 180 days there, so we're okay. In this example, there's 124 days. In 2013, it was 40. 2012, 40. So what's the total? 184, you're one day over the limit. Um, and when we covered this topic, um, going back, what, a couple of years ago? Thomas? So Thomas, uh, about two years ago we did this topic, and we would cover the topic, and I, I had a few clients just have this ash and gray look. The blood just kind of came out of their, their face. Um, you know, so the issue is, will the tax authorities really catch up on you? That Maybe, maybe not. I mean, we go back and forth across the border. I suspect the system eventually will be smart enough to catch that. So again, these examples will be in the document, so when you... Uh, um, if you want the document, then we'll email it to you or it gets you that attachment. I think there's a great chart. Um, there's the taxes you pay and then the taxes you would pay if you're diligent around your tax planning. Um, now, there, I, I think it's really critical to take a look at every once in a while some planning. And if you look at your feedback form, what I, what I had in there is an opportunity for you, both for clients and guests today. Um, a complimentary discussion and review of your tax plan. And so if you look at your package again, just open up your package right now, you'll see your feedback form. So Thomas has, has graciously offered his expertise. So if you want to, it's basically a, a two-step process. We do a bit of an exploratory um, information gathering. 
we do a bit of an analysis. Part of that analysis, you'll see a handle called the retirement snapshot. So we do a little bit of forecasting for you. And then part of that forecasting will be a tax audit. So Thomas, Phil, and I are going to look, work diligently, obviously, to take a look at your situation just to make sure you're taking advantage of all the opportunities you can. You might go through that process and you're going to get a gold star. Awesome. Hopefully we've been doing a great job for you. But we might uncover some little things that you need to tweak or fine tune. And so when we sit down and go through that, we'll look at each of the major areas. There's a whole bunch of areas, obviously, we didn't have a chance to talk about today. Uh, we have a lot of resources on the website. So again, if you are looking for just general financial resources, like I said, um, we will make sure that you're given the links to this presentation. So when you fill out your feedback form, um, if we do have your content information email, we'll make sure you have the links to other resources as well as the presentation today. I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedules uh, to join us today. It sometimes takes, uh, you know, we have to fight through the natural inertia of life to, to come out. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, that we gave you a little bit of value. Uh, if, if nothing else, if we prompted you to go, you know, maybe we should look at our tax planning, or retirement income plan in a little more detail, I think that would be a great outcome, right? So I wish you all the best in your journey financially as you look at those areas. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, what did you think of the venue? You enjoyed the venue today? Yeah. Great. <laughs> so staff at the Qualico Center here did a great job. And um, I know that both uh, well, Thomas, Phil, myself will hang around for a while if you have any specific questions on some of the content uh, that was covered today. Leave your feedback forms on the table or you can just leave them on the desk here as you go out. And we are going to have a draw now. So let's do that right now. See who the lucky winner is.